The next part is related to residual analysis. So that's part of the last step of the model checking down here, where we have to look at, well, if the model we use, are the residuals from that or the errors, do they resemble white noise? That's the question that we are looking into. So you're also looking into, well, is the model order uniquely determined as a set of parameters P and Q? And the answer to that question is no. That also means when you're going to do this in practice, I don't expect that two different individuals will end up always with the same model. Of course, sometimes there will be one model that is the most, and everyone will find the same, but often it's not the case. So how can we check that the model errors resemble white noise? Well, first of all, plot the data, plot the residuals. Here are some examples where the first one, top left here, is white noise, and the other three are not white noise. And the ways they are non-white noise is that for this one up here, the variance is increasing over time. Down here, we have something that is having a high probability of large positive residuals and small negative residuals. So it's not symmetric. It's and another thing is you could have some single outliers and the rest be maybe normal. So what do you do when you look at residuals? Well, often people are plotting different kind of histograms. Here I've just added the theoretical curve. This is the one that's truly right noise. But if you look at the one where you have variance in homogeneity, it's very diff difficult to actually say this is not white. You cannot see the difference. Whereas if it's very skewed, it's easy to see that it doesn't fit. And the outlier out here, well, it's also clear that you need to consider what to do about that one there. Another typical thing is to look at so-called QQ plots, whereas for the truly white noise, it looks nice. And for the non-white, where you have a variance in the see in the data, it actually also looks reasonably okay here. When you have the asymmetric, it becomes very clear that it's not falling along the expected line. And the residual here, or the outli two outliers, are also sticking out quite a bit. So what to do in the different cases is, of course, different. If you can get around without these outliers, maybe the rest up here is actually good. So one thing is the so-called one particular test, because I like to first look at data, look at the residuals, but you should also do some statistical testing to s validate that your gut feeling is actually tr holding all the way true. So if epsilon t is white noise, then it will every other residual would change sign. So that means it will change sign probability 0.5, and the number of chi sign changes is n minus 1, following a binomial distribution with n minus 1 observations, because there's n minus 1 times that you can change sign in n observations, with probability 0.5. Now you can look it up in that, but when n is sufficiently large, and since we are indeed at the center, then the normal distribution approximation is fairly good. So the expectation is n minus 1 half, and the variance is n minus 1 divided by 4. So this is the normal distribution approximation to the density of the binomial if you have n equal 100. And here it's actually quite good. So if we do the sign test, in this case we have 100 observations from a white noise process. Then if we do what we just said before, we should expect a number between 40 and 59 sign changes in practice. And in particular sample, we got 47. And 47 is nicely within this interval, so we cannot reject that this is white noise. Now, what does this sign test help you identify when it fails? It could say, well, if you have too few sign changes, then you could have a positive one-step correlation. If you have too many, then you can have a negative correlation meaning that you change sign every time. 
Now, but it could also be that either too many, too many, few may indicate that the probability of being above the mean value, as in you have something, a biased process, then that may also give something that is different. Now, as I kind of indicated when plotting the TS diag plot for the time series estimates before, you can do a test to test if the autocorrelation are actually significant or not in the residuals. So rho epsilon as in the autocorrelation of like k for a white noise signal is approximately normally distributed with zero mean and a variance of 1 over n. That also means if you do a sum of the m first autocorrelations and we multiply that by the square root of n, then we get something that is standard normal distribution. So we get a sum of m squared, standard normally distributed variables. Then we have a chi-square test that follows a chi-square distribution with m degrees of freedom. Now, so that's a theoretical thing. So when we look at the model errors where we have estimated parameters, then the 1 over n is still the limit for the variance. However, the number of degrees of freedom are different because when we sum these, that's pretty much the same thing we do, but we did estimate n parameters. So we tried to reduce it so it's no longer m degrees of freedom, but it's m minus n degrees of freedom. So that is, if things are white noise, it follows this chi-square distribution. And we can test in that as well. So in summary, plot the residuals. Do they have any weird patterns? Test the autocorrelation function. Feel free to do the TS diag function in R. It does the Young box test, which is exactly doing what we have here. Now, what we have, uh, that's what is stated here. We call it also the Young box test, and it's what you get from the TS diag. So look at the autocorrelation function for the individual elements as we did, but also look at the sum of elements of the autocorrelation function down here to do the so called Young box test. As mentioned, you can also do the sign change test, and you can use binom.test function in R, give the number of sign changes and give the number of possible sign changes as arguments, and it will give you the conclusion. Well, at least to give you the output so you can make the conclusion. I'll just show you the accumulated periodogram, how it works. And that's another way to see if there are some frequency patterns that are not explained. And you can get, you can say, the limits for this, there's a table 6.2 that gives you how to define the limits to get the different probability intervals for the cumulative periodograms. So, if you're doing, when you're doing the residual analysis, you can detect problems with the residuals, looking at the one step prediction errors, then you can kind of look at, well, if you have autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation function, you can say, in the model development scheme, you're going down to the validation, you say, no, I, but I now I know how to update my model. And if the model passed the residual analysis, then the next step is to test the null process about the parameters, which is, well, as I also showed you in the small code example, we want to see if the parameters are significantly different from zero, yes or no. How can we do that? Well, there are many cases. I did the very simple one there, which I'll get back to in a moment. Basically, the many more parameters you add to a model, the lower the sum of squared residuals. So, but then when is the model big enough? I like to do testing. So 
I won't look at this, but I just know that when this flats out, it means that adding these extra parameters doesn't really act provide any better predictions because the sum of square predictions remains the same. So we should be somewhere over here in the so-called ALBO. But I prefer to do things in a formal way whenever I can. So what we have to do is to check if the reduction in the sum of squared errors, S1 minus S2, is sufficiently large to justify the extra parameter. Let's say we have n observations in this case, and you have n1 parameters in the first model and n2 in the second model. So n2, has n2 is greater than n1. Now, what we do is then to look at whether the extra parameters in, in model 2, could they be assumed to be zero versus the alternative hypothesis that they are different from zero. We do that by using the standard F-test to look at the difference in the sum of squared residuals normalized by the difference in the degrees of freedom for the parameters, and then we normalize by the complex model divided by its degrees of freedom. The ratio of two chi-square distribution is F distributed with parameters N2 minus N1, namely the number of difference in parameters, and N minus 2, which is N minus N2, which is the number of degrees of freedom for the residuals in the large model. We can also do a like loot ratio test if you know of that. But I'll get back to examples with that next week. If we just want to look at a single parameter, we can do similar to what I just did. What I did was doing a simple t-test to test if a parameter is equal to zero versus it's different from zero, where what I want to do is I look at the estimate divided by the square root of the variance, as in the estimate divided by the standard deviation, and then under the null hypothesis for an RMP comma Q model, this follows a T distribution with N minus P minus Q degrees of freedom. However, if you also estimate the, the overall mean in the process, you have to subtract one more parameter that you estimated. But, I mean, in practice, N is usually so large that we can just use the standard normal distribution. Or you can say, if you just want to do something quickly, you can do as we did with the coding example here before. Let me just show. The estimates down here, we look at the estimate and the standard deviation. If the estimate is less than two times the standard devi deviation, then it's not significant. But we also saw that this one was not significant, but when removing the AR2 part, it became significant. So don't remove all that are non-significant at once. Remove them one by one in general. OK. So another way of selecting models, all we've done so far is for models where you can go from one model to the sub-model by setting some parameters to zero, which means that models are nested. But what if they're not nested? What if you want to compare an AR1 model with an MA1 model? Then they're not nested, and you have to do something different. The typical thing to do is to minimize some information criteria. A classical one is a Kaikis information criteria that is minus two times the log of the likelihood plus a penalty of two times the number of parameters. A variant of that is the so-called Bayesian information criteria, where, again, it's minus two times the log of the likelihood. And then it comes plus lo the logarithm of n times the number of parameters. So the difference between the AIC and the BIC is the penalty for adding an extra parameter. When n is large, the log of n is greater than 2, which means there's a larger penalty, which means in general the AIC models tend, the AIC criteria tend to give you a larger model than the BIC. 
if you compare with doing traditional t-test and f-test, the AIC typically compares to using a not a 5% level that we like to do, but a 10% level. So you can say it's always, you can say use the AIC and then look at, do I need to reduce this further by looking at nested models from there, whereas the BIC will tend to get you closer to what is also statistically the most important model. Now, except for an additive constant, the AIC, the log of the likelihood here is the logarithm of the estimator of sigma square. And that, of course, also holds for the Bayesian information criteria. And since in practice, well, you want to compare AIC of one model with another model, and the additive constant, well, is a constant. When you just look at the difference between numbers, well, you add a constant to both, doesn't change the difference. So this is what you need. I covered the last bit. So in highlights, what we look at is how to estimate the sample autocollation function. We discussed the so-called table for identifying of armor models, how to do iterative model building by making models for residuals and then figure out what else do I need to add to the model to get to an even better model and hopefully to model where the residuals are close enough to white noise so that you can say that you got a good model. But you also have to keep in mind that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Showed you some tools for doing residual analysis. Showed you some testing of significant uh, individual parameters. And then how to use information criteria in particular when things are not nested. So that was all for now. See you around.